sutra. Then the first common instructed Rahula to strike a bell once, and he asked Ananda, "Did you hear that?" Ananda and the members of the great assembly all said, "We heard it." Commentary: It has already been said that the nature of hearing is neither produced nor extinguished, but Ananda has misunderstood the principle the Buddha has been explaining, and given rise to more doubts. So now the Buddha investigates the nature of hearing with the sound of the bell that has been struck. Then the first command instructed Rahula to strike a bell once. Rahula is the Buddha's only son. His name means the obstacle, Fu Cha, because he remained in his mother's womb for six years before he was born. This is not terribly unusual in China. There are many such cases. One famous case was that of Lao Lai Tzu, who had white hair and eyebrows and could talk from the moment of birth. He was born old, but he nevertheless still acted like a child and was rambunctious. There was also Lao Tzu, of course, who is said to have stayed in his mother's womb for eighty-one years. His surname was Li. And he was nicknamed Lao Tzu or Lao Dan. Compared to these two strange incidents, Rahula's dwelling in his mother's womb for six years is not so spectacular. Since he was the Buddha's son, Rahula was very obedient. So the Buddha said, "Go ring the bell." Then he asked Ananda, "Did you hear that?" Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said, "We heard it." Sutra. The bell ceased to sound, and the Buddha again asked, "Do you hear it now?" Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said, "We do not hear it." Commentary. The bell ceased to sound. The sound of the bell faded away. There was no sound. The Buddha again asked, "Do you hear it now?" The Buddha asked Ananda, "Well, do you hear it not, or don't you?" Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said, "We do not hear it. We don't hear it at all now." Sutra. Then Rahula struck the bell once again. The Buddha again asked, "Do you hear it now?" Ananda and the Great Assembly again said, "We hear it." Commentary. Once the sound of the bell had ceased. And the Buddha had asked his question. Rahula figured out what to do next. He was very intelligent. Rahula was foremost in secret practices. People never realized that he was cultivating. No one knew that every day he was developing his skill. What did he do? He could enter samadhi at any time in any place. When he went to the bathroom, he could enter samadhi. When it was time to eat. He could eat, but he was also in samadhi. His mind was not on the food, but no one ever caught on. So he was said to be for most in secret practices. Just take reciting the Suragama mantra as an example. No one saw him recite the mantra, and yet he could do it by heart. No one ever noticed him studying it or practicing it. But he could recite from memory. Since Rahula was foremost in secret practices, he was very intelligent and perceptive of the Buddha's intent. And so, after the sound of the bell had ceased for a time, Rahula struck the bell once again. The Buddha again asked Ananda, "Do you hear it now?" "Well, do you hear it now?" The Buddha pressed Ananda. Ananda and the Great Assembly again said. We hear it. We hear it. They exclaimed. The bell just rang. This situation, the bell being rung, and they are then being asked if they had heard it, is the ordinary happening the Buddha mentioned. Wouldn't you say that anyone could understand this process of striking the bell and then asking if it was heard, since Ananda had failed to understand the doctrines explained earlier? The Buddha now uses this very simple example to illustrate them. Sutra. The Buddha asked Ananda, "What do you 
What do you hear and what do you not hear? Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said to the Buddha, When the bell is rang, we hear it. Once the sound of the bell ceases, so that even if the echo fades away, we do not hear it. Commentary The Buddha asked Ananda, What do you hear and what do you not hear? I want to hear what you have to say. Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said to the Buddha, When the bell is rung, hear it. When the bell is struck, we all hear the bell sound. Once the sound of the bell ceases, a while after a bell is struck, its sound disappears so that even its echo fades away. Both the sound and the echo are gone, then we do not hear it. That's what we mean by not hearing. So, the problem that Ananda and the Great Assembly are having is to be found in their not hearing. They think that when there is no sound, there is no hearing. Actually, though, when there is no sound, what perceives that there is no hearing, that which knows there is no hearing is hearing itself. If you were really without hearing, then you basically would not know whether you were hearing or not. That's the important point. Sutra, the first came on again, instructed Rahula to strike the bell, and he asked Ananda, Is there sound now? Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said, There is a sound. Commentary, the Buddha, the first come on again, instructed Rahula to strike the bell, and he asked Ananda, Is there sound now? Ananda and the members of the Great Assembly all said, There is a sound. Sutra, after a short time, the sound ceased, and the Buddha again asked, Is there a sound now? Ananda and the Great Assembly answered, There is no sound. Commentary, after a short time, after just a bit, the sound ceased, the bell stopped ringing, and the Buddha again asked Ananda, Is there a sound now? Do you still hear a sound, or don't you? Ananda and the Great Assembly answered, There is no sound. Sutra, after a moment, Rahula again struck the bell, and the Buddha again asked, Is there sound now? Ananda and the Great Assembly said together, There is sound. Commentary, after a moment, that is, in a little while, Rahula again struck the bell, and the Buddha again asked, Is there sound now? What about it? Is there any sound? Or isn't there? Ananda and the Great Assembly said together, there is sound. Sutra, the Buddha asked Ananda, what is meant by sound and what is meant by no sound. Ananda and the Great Assembly told the Buddha, when the bell is struck, there is sound. Once the sound ceases and even the echo fades away, there is said to be no sound. Commentary, the Buddha asked Ananda, what is meant by sound? Explain to me the difference between there being a sound and there not being any sound. Ananda and the Great Assembly told the Buddha, When the bell is struck, there is sound. That's what he mean by sound. Once the sound ceases and even the echo fades away, after the bell has been struck, then the sound dies away. There is said to be no sound. Sutra the Buddha said to Ananda and the Great Assembly, Why are you inconsistent in what you say? The Great Assembly and Ananda then asked the Buddha, In what way have we been inconsistent? The Buddha said, When I asked if you were hearing, you said that you were hearing. Then when I asked you if there was sound, you said there was sound. I cannot ascertain from your answers if it is hearing or if it is sound. How can you not say this is inconsistent? Commentary, the Buddha said to Ananda and the Great Assembly, Why are you inconsistent in what you say? What do you, why do you contradict yourselves? What you say isn't even reasonable. The Great Assembly and Ananda then asked the Buddha, In what way have we been inconsistent? How are we being unreasonable in what we say? The Buddha said, When I asked you if you were hearing, you said that you were hearing. Then, when I asked you if there was sound, you said there was sound. You, I said, 
Do you hear or not? You said that I hear. Then I asked, is there sound or not? And you said there is sound. I cannot ascertain from your answers if it is hearing or if it is sound. You say it is both hearing and sound. Which one is it ultimately? Your answers don't specify. How can you not say this is inconsistent? Sutra Ananda, when the sound is gone without an echo, you say there is no hearing. If there were really no hearing, the hearing nature would be extinguished. It would be just like dead wood. If then the bell was sounded again, how would you know? Commentary Ananda, the Buddha says, you are not distinguishing clearly between sound and hearing, and this is a point which you do not understand. This is a place where you are really upside down. Why can't you even tell the difference between hearing and sound? Ananda, when the sound is, is gone without an echo, you say there is no hearing. If there were really no hearing, the hearing nature would be extinguished. It would be the end of the hearing nature. There should be no longer any capacity for hearing. And yet when there is another sound, the hearing is still there. It isn't gone after all. If there really was no hearing nature, it would be just like a dead wood. If then the bell was sounded again, how would you know? This is the important point. Also the sound ceases. The hearing nature has not been cut off. It is still in operation. Because the hearing nature is not subject to production or extinction, the sound is subject to production and extinction, but the nature of hearing is not. There is hearing whether or not there is sound. So when the sound ceased and he answered that there was no hearing, it was a mistake. That's the place where he misunderstood. That's where he is upside down. So try what you know to be there and not or not there is the defiling object of sound. But could the hearing nature be there or not be there depending on your perception of its being there or not? If the hearing could really not be there, what would perceive that it was not? Commentary What you know to be there or not there is the defiling object of sound. Of course, what you notice being there or not being there belongs to sound. But could the hearing nature be there or not be there? Is that the way the hearing nature is? Is it that it exists when there is sound and doesn't exist? When there is no sound, when there is sound, there is hearing. When there is no sound, there is still hearing. The nature of hearing is neither produced nor extinguished. Sound is subject to production and extinction. When there is a certain vibration, there is sound. And when that vibration ceases, there is no sound. But the hearing nature does not appear and disappear depending on your perception of its being there or not. The hearing nature doesn't take its cues from you. If the hearing could really not be there, if you say that the hearing nature really can cease to exist in the absence of sound, what would perceive that it was not? What would know of its absence? What would perceive that there was no hearing? What That which knows the essence of hearing is your hearing nature. You say that you know that you are not hearing, but if you really didn't have a hearing nature at that point, you wouldn't even realize that you were not hearing. Sutra and so Ananda, the sound that you hear are what are subject to production and extinction, not your hearing. The arising and cessation of sounds cause your hearing nature to be as if there or not there. Commentary and so because of this ananda, the sounds that you hear are what are subject to production and distinction. The sounds you hear arise and cease, the arising and cessation of sounds cause your hearing nature to be as if they are or not there. When the sounds come forth and die away, it is not your hearing that is there or not there. That's not what happens. Whether there is sound or not, the hearing nature remains throughout. 
Sutra, you are so upside down that you mistake sound for hearing. No wonder you are so confused that you take what is everlasting for what is annihilated. Ultimately, you cannot say that there is no hearing nature apart from movement and stillness and from obstruction and penetration. Commentary: You are so upside down that you mistake sound for hearing. Ananda, you don't even recognize where you yourself are upside down. That's why I say that you don't even recognize the difference between right side up and upside down. You think that sound is hearing and that hearing is sound. How can this be? Sound and hearing are different. No wonder you are so confused that you take what is everlasting for what is annihilated. It's not surprising that you are so mixed up. No wonder you don't understand. You think that the true, permanent, undying nature is subject to annihilation. When did I ever tell you that the tranquil, true mind will cease to be? It is fundamentally an eternally abiding principle, and you say that it will come to an end, that it will disappear. You're really awfully confused. How do you know? How do I know that? You can't even tell the difference between sound and hearing. It's such a simple matter, but you say that it is both sound and hearing that arises and ceases to be. In the end, which is it? Why are you so muddled? Ultimately, you cannot say that there is no hearing nature apart from movement and stillness, and from obstruction and penetration. You should never say that apart from these conditions, the nature of hearing does not exist. How could it not exist? The hearing nature abides forever. Sutra: Consider a person who falls into a deep sleep while napping on his bed. While he is asleep, someone in his household starts beating clothes or pounding rice. In his dream. The person hears the sound of beating and pounding and takes it for something else, perhaps for the striking of a drum or the ringing of a bell. In the dream, he wonders why the bell sounds like stone or wood. Commentary above sound was discussed in order to understand the nature of hearing. In talking about the sound of the bell. We came to note that the hearing nature is neither produced nor extinguished. If the hearing nature were extinguished, there would be no further hearing. But when the bell is struck, the nature of hearing is neither produced nor extinguished. Regardless of whether there is sound, the hearing nature abides forever. Now the Buddha makes use of another. Ordinary happening to illustrate that the nature of hearing is neither produced nor extinguished. Consider a person who falls into a deep sleep while napping on his bed. He is so sound asleep that he does not wake up when someone calls him. But even though he does not awaken, his hearing nature is still present. He perceives sounds, if mistakenly, even though he is asleep. The mistake is not made by the hearing nature. It is the sixth mind consciousness, the solitary consciousness, which makes the mistaken perception. This person then is in such a deep sleep that he is unaware of everything. While he is asleep, someone in his household starts beating clothes or pounding rice. Beating clothes refers to the method of washing clothes used of old. I remember seeing this done when I was a child. There was a flat stone, and two beating sticks made of wood. They would lay in the clothes on the stone and beat them clean with the sticks, in a rhythmic fashion. Pounding rice. Refer. I remember that in Great Master, the sixth patriarch, pounded rice for eight months. One uses a pestle, and also stamps on the coarse grains. With one's feet, in order to separate the chaff from the kernel, these methods were used in ancient China, and obviously they were familiar to the Indian way of life as well. So the Buddha gave these two examples. In his dream, 
The person hears the sound of beating and pounding and takes it for something else. That person refers to the one who is asleep. He hears the sounds of the clothes being beaten and the rice being pounded, but in his dreams he misinterprets them as something else. What does he think they are? He mistakes them perhaps for the striking of a drum or the ringing of a bell. In the dream, he wonders why the bell sounds like stone or wood. How come that bell sounds like a piece of wood or stone? He thinks. In the dream state, the sixth mind consciousness, the solitary consciousness, misinterprets the sound. Dreams are other tricks played by the sixth mind consciousness. It takes control of you and causes you to dream certain things. Why did this person take the sound he heard to be the striking of a drum or the ringing of a bell? Then, when in fact it was neither of these sounds, it came from a mistaken impression on his part during his dream, and that's why he wonders why the sound is more like wood or stone being struck like a bell. He finds it strange. Dreams happen when the sixth mind consciousness goes awry. Whatever happens to you during the day, and whatever experiences you encounter, it will affect the dreams you have at night. Some people who cultivate the way, cultivate the mind consciousness until they can go out as to, to esoterically and enter mysteriously through Xuan Ru Pin, and go out esoterically. To go out esoterically means to send a being out. Of the crown of one's head, this being can then leave the body and go elsewhere. But this experience is not genuine because the being is a yin spirit. Since when it gets out, it has a certain amount of awareness. It is called a spirit. Once there was an old Taoist who really was skilled in his practice, but he had a big temper. Whenever anything came up, he'd get angry about it. Since he got angry all the time, he was indulging in hatred. He considered himself to be well skilled, however, to be pretty remarkable. In fact, he boasted that as soon as he went to sleep, he could send out this spirit. It was like a dream state, but he had an awareness of it and could remember it clearly afterward. One day. The old Taoist encountered a Buddhist monk, and they discussed their methods of cultivation. The Taoist said, "In Taoism, we can cultivate and become immortal. What talent do you Buddhists have?" Shakyamuni Buddha died just the same, but no one knows where the patriarch of Taoism, Li Laotun, went. He died, so they say, but really he went to the heavens. So the skill we develop in Taoism is to go out esoterically and enter mysteriously. How do you go out esoterically? Asked the monk. When I lie down and go to sleep, I can go anywhere I please. The Taoist replied. Oh, fine. Go to sleep now and send out a spirit while I watch. Said the monk. The old Taoist laid down and went to sleep. And as soon as he dozed off, he let out a spirit. But what kind? It was a snake that crawled out of the top of his head. The snake slithered off the side of the bed onto the floor and crawled outside to the edge of the cesspool. He drank some of the dirty water and then crept along the edge of the water. The monk picked a blade of grass. And set it in the path, and then pulled up a clump of salt, and set it beside the blade. When the snake saw the blade of grass, it fled in fright and scurried back where it had come from. Having re-entered the crown of the Taoist head, the old cultivator awoke in a sweat, scared to death. Where did you go? asked the monk. When you went out the top of your head. The Taoist replied, "I went to the heavens to the, a heavenly pool. He had mistaken the cesspool for a heavenly pool. 
When I got to the heavenly pool, I drank some sweet dew water, and then, as I strolled around, I saw a spirit in golden armor standing in the path, wielding a sword. He was intent upon killing me, so I rushed back. The monk said, "Oh, so that's what happened. According to you, you went to the heavens."